I want to know how the world works. I scan the hierarchy of being, from fundamental physics to physical chemistry, biochemistry, biology, psychology, sociology. Bottom to top, I see mathematics. And I wonder, is the math really there at the foundations making it all happen? Or is the math merely our way of describing the data, curve fitting, approximating relationships, or hand waving, making simple models? This distinction between math as intrinsic and fundamental versus math as extrinsic and descriptive seems especially relevant for probability. Does probability have a split personality in explicating science? A potential duality between probability as fundamental to the driving essence and probability as descriptive of the observational data. It's this potential duality, these two pillars of probability, that I'll call the deep meaning of probability. What is the deep meaning of probability? I'm Robert Lawrence Kuhn, and Closer to Truth is my journey to find out. I'm going to follow probability's potential two pillars. Pillar one, probability as the intrinsic beating heart of quantum physics, also resonating in biology from neural networks to population genetics. Pillar two, applied probability, predicting the likelihood of future events and its offspring statistics, analyzing the frequency of past events. But to begin, I get the basics. I go to a mathematician who specializes in probability, Columbia's Ivan Corwin. Ivan, when I think about probability theory, I'm, I'm, I'm torn between two different uh, visions of it. One is as a descriptor of the world. On the other hand, probability is baked into the fundamentals of reality through quantum theory. Give me your overview of, 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 of what the field is and how it was founded. Probability as a field, it was only really axiomatized in the 30s uh, in work of Komogorov in Russia. Part of the reason why probability hadn't really, you know, lifted off before then was that because it was seen as, a, as an offense to the gods. You know, the notion that you would try to predict the outcome of something, that wasn't very favorable because the gods were the ones who were dictating what the outcomes would be. Now, luckily, gambling came into the picture and people, some people, including Cardano, who, who was one of the real founders of probability in the 15th century, he introduced some of the, the sort of fundamental ideas of probability. For instance, the, the idea of enumerating a state space and assigning probabilities to different events. So, you know, if you roll a die, there are six outcomes and you assign probabilities to each of these. Uh, and so people would play games and because they didn't really have the notions of probability, they didn't know how to compute probabilities of outcomes. So once somebody kind of thought about it and was willing to really enumerate and then assign probabilities, they were able to make a lot of money. Now, let me tell you the kind of the biggest developments of probability. So the first uh, was in 1600s, 1630s or so, and it was the law of large numbers. And this is the result, of, you know, you've probably heard it, you flip a coin uh, two times, you know, you can have a head, a head, a head, a tail, a tail, a head, a tail, a tail, and each one's a quarter. But now if you flip it a thousand times or, you know, 10,000 times, and you look at the number of heads versus the number of tails, you'll find that the ratio will converge to a half. Now, the fact that that ratio really, really converged to the sort of expected, uh, you know, the, the probabilities is what's called the law of large numbers. And that result in the case of fair coin flips was proved, you know, about 300 years ago. And then it took actually quite a while for people to show that it wasn't just for coin flips, that there were kind of other types of systems that would describe this sort of uh, scaling limit that if you do a lot, you do it a lot, you'll you'll converge to some deterministic limit. And the the next level that that one goes to in probability, it's the, what's called the central limit theorem. And the idea there is, you if you actually flip a coin a thousand times, you don't get five hundred heads and five hundred tails, but you usually get within say plus or minus fifty. And where's that plus or minus fifty coming from? It says that in the scale of the square root of the system size, you will see a bell curve emerge. 
you know, you've heard of bell curves, you've heard of Gaussian distribution, and it's not because it's the answer to how many coin flips you, you know, how many heads do you get and tails. It's because it comes up all over the place in, in mathematics and in science. And, and the third is came from insurance, and it's called large deviation theory. There are certain situations where you don't care about the average behavior you care about aberrant behaviors. The one in a million who does something sensationally good or sensationally bad. Or if you're insurance, you care about that one out of a million chance that the building burns down. And so the challenge there was to understand how do you estimate the probability of extremely unlikely events occurring. And you might think, you know, who cares about large deviations? But every time you turn your car on, something needs to happen. And you, and you want that that thing happens and the probability something bad happens is exponentially small compared to the number of times you actually turn the car on. So this is a, a little bit of the sort of history of thematically what, what probability thinks about. Probability's three foundational themes provide good grounding to discern probability's potential two pillars and thus to probe probability's deep meaning. The law of large numbers, which forces convergence. The central limit theorem, which generates normal distributions, the large deviation theory, which quantifies rare events. To seek probability's deep meaning, I'm now prepared to observe probability in the wild, how probability works in the real world of science, and I go straight to the wildest. Cosmology, our vast universe. I seek an astrophysicist who develops statistical tools to analyze cosmological data, including large-scale galactic structure and the cosmic microwave background, Licia Verde. You have to understand that uh, when you have uh, some data to analyze, uh, you first start using probability as a tool. And, and cosmology is a particular interesting example because there are several types of probability that are involved. There is the probability that simply describe measurements errors. When you make a measurement, you always make a little bit of a mistake, but right. there is a theory of probability that tells you what the mistake you make right. and therefore what's the most likely right. correct value. Right. And around. more measurements yeah. you make, the you smaller is the gets. error bars, right. and in the limit you can arrive to basically zero error if you make infinite yeah. measurements. When we talk about cosmology, we are dealing with a deeper sense of probability, yeah. and here it's one step of abstraction. It's the probability of the model that describes the universe. So instead of treating the probability like saying there is a truth model and then I do the experiment and I check what the probability of the data is given the model. I want to invert that right. and I want to assign a probability to the model because I want to know what is the model, the correct model that describes the universe. Right. And all I have are the observations right. and not the model. Right. So give me some examples. The microwave background is probably the simplest example. In a measurement of the cosmic microwave background, the, the experiment wants to measure the temperature or the polarization of the sky in a particular direction, right. which in this picture will become a pixel. And then in that pixel, there will be an error, a measurement error that has got to do with the noise that is in your instrument and how well you can do that measurement. But then there is another uh, error associated to that because the universe we see is one possible realization of all the possible universes hmm. that your model could have generated, yeah. and maybe other model, other similar model could have generated that are still consistent with the picture of the universe we have. And what we want to infer is what is the probability of the model that are generated mm -hmm. this data that we observe. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And we also have to put into account the fact that we see the universe we see, we don't see all the universe, which is much bigger. Okay. So you have to put all that into okay. your error bars and state what you are saying and what the meaning of, say, I measure something. The very interesting things that come in is when you ask, well, if this is the primordial universe, if this is the baby universe, and there are already inhomogeneity in there, who or what put them there? 
Yeah, people have very theoretical model about quantum mechanics is so small and exactly you know, it's but very then exciting. you well know that in quantum mechanics there's probability everywhere <laughs> oh, yeah, right. so we go back yeah. to randomness right. and probability right, 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 so right. in some sense we are a product of uncertainty and probability yeah. because it's the quantum randomness mm -hmm. that creates those perturbations mm -hmm. and out of those perturbations, gravity worked on them for some 14 billion years yeah. and here we are yeah. having this interesting discussion. So in essence, you're talking about three kinds of probability radically, each one radically different from each other. Yes, and it's the same theory of probability, which you can write down with the same kind of equation and the same kind of machinery that allows you to describe this three different type of probability and they all get rolled up into an error bar about what we think the universe is made of, say. <laughs> Those error bars encoding probabilities help reveal the composition of the cosmos. Plesia distinguishes three kinds of probability in cosmology. The first is how tightly measurements cluster around particular values which is a test of confidence in those values, this is probability's pillar one. The second kind of probability is how the measured values support a given model that claims to describe the universe. This applies probability's pillar one. The third kind of probability is the inherent uncertainty of quantum mechanics in the very early universe and gravity's astonishing amplification of those minuscule fluctuations to construct, over aeons of time, the vast galaxies and stars we see today. This is probability's pillar two. But the deep meaning of probability in physics and cosmology is debated. I speak with the author of Existential Physics, a physicist who relishes challenging current belief Sabine Hassenfelder. The reason we are not making much progress on the foundations of physics is that on a really fundamental level, we do not understand probability. So probability appears prominently, of course, in quantum mechanics, but it also appears in the discussion about the multiverse, um, the question of why are the constants of nature, these particular constants that we observe, and also in the argument that the Large Hadron Collider should have seen new particles besides the Higgs boson, which has not happened. The whole issue with quantum mechanics is that the wave function is not the probability distribution, but you calculate the probability distribution from the wave function, and the probability distribution is the only thing that we can observe, whereas the wave function itself is not observable. <laughs> so the problem with the multiverse is that uh, in the multiverse you have this infinite number of universes, which brings up questions of the type, why do we find ourselves in this particular universe with um, these particular values of uh, the constants of nature that we have measured? And there are some anthropic arguments that you have to take into account here, like we just cannot live in certain kinds of uh, universes with certain constants. Uh, but once you have that, um, you still have a distribution over universes uh, in which we could find ourselves. And what you then want to argue is that in this multiverse, we would be likely to find ourselves in something that looks like what we actually see. The reason you want that is to argue that the multiverse actually explains something. Now, now the problem with that is that um, if you have an infinite number of universes, it is very difficult uh, to properly define some notion of probability on that. So you, you always end up comparing infinities to infinities, and that's not a mathematically well-defined procedure. Um, you have to use additional assumptions to fix that problem. And that goes into the next uh, category that you mentioned. If you look at all the constants that are in the standard model, then they all look good, they all look reasonable, reasonably probable, except for one, which is the mass of the Higgs boson. And now physicists were arguing before the Large Hadron Collider turned on, that um, this particular constant is so improbable 
that um, the standard model cannot be the last word. Instead, there has to be more to particle physics, um, which would explain why this constant is what it is. So um, the, the goal is that you amend the standard model so that this constant eventually turns out to be probable. This goes under the name naturalness argument. And these naturalness arguments were the key reason why so many theoretical physicists believed that the Large Hadron Collider should see some new physics besides the Higgs boson. This naturalness argument is um, also sometimes called an argument from fine-tuning. Uh, it basically says that um, there are certain cancellations between numbers that have to work out very, very precisely. This is a notion of fine-tuning, um, but you can also see it um, as uh, an unnatural coincidence. Right. So this is where this, this unnaturalness uh, comes from. Right, so if you have what looks like fine-tuning on, on its surface, you have to search for something else to make it natural, exactly. or you have to have an unnatural explanation for the fine tuning, which uh, gives the physicists hives. Uh, yes, exactly. Um, it's just that on a fundamental level, you can very well just accept that this constant is whatever it is. Yeah. So uh, ultimately, this argument goes back to a specific assumption about the probability distribution parameters. Mm -hmm in some space which we cannot observe. Because the only thing we can observe is our universe with this particular selection of the constants of nature. So making any kind of assumption about the probability of the constants of nature in a space uh, that we cannot really observe is, for what I'm concerned, uh, not, not proper science. To Sabine, probability is a lens through which physics and cosmology can be viewed. I'm intrigued by the naturalness argument. It seems so fine-tuned as to be unnatural, such that a natural explanation is required and must be found. But when that natural explanation is a multiverse, Sabina says that is not science. But probability is not limited, of course, to physics and cosmology. Probability pervades science, biology, psychology, sociology, medicine. Everywhere there is data. I meet an expert in data science and complex systems, Aaron Classe. Probability is a way of wrapping up things we don't understand, of variability, of randomness. The idea of randomness being that if I were to you know, rerun the tape of the world a second time, slightly different things might happen because maybe I don't know the initial conditions of the system perfectly well. And so as a result, the systems diverge slightly in these two different runs of the simulation, so to speak. And in order to capture sort of the underlying mechanisms that are driving the whole system, I need to be able to capture that variability. And so in practice, what we do with uh, probabilistic modeling is we stuff that variability into an error term. And we say that there is a set of deterministic rules that govern the way things work on average. And then there's some randomness that we include to capture the variability that um, we're not covering with. And so the, the size of error bars, how big it is at any point, is a very important descriptor of the system. So if a system is uh, very unpredictable, the error bars will be enormous because you are not able to capture enough of the underlying mechanisms to explain that variability. So the role of taking these large data sets and trying to boil them down into scientific insights is partly about starting with a model that is very poor, that puts most of the variability into the error term, and then slowly picking apart what are the threads of causality, and then pulling those pieces out of the error model, out of the probabilistic mm. part. Um, so that you can capture that structure more readily. And that leaves all the other stuff we don't understand sort of captured by the probability. Looking at the large data sets we have available today, these probabilistic models that use probability to capture the variation of things, this is the, the, the only way that we can extract insight from these data sets about complex systems. Because in complex systems, the ways things can interact with each other can be so complicated. When you're thinking about the behavior of a cell, the genome is incredibly complicated, and the environment has a role. And so 
in order to get a good model, you have to th you have to be able to throw out some of the factors. And doing that means you have to put them into the probability part. I stand humble before the power and ubiquity of probability. I like probability as a way of wrapping up things we don't understand, using this information, these variables we capture, to tease out underlying mechanisms driving whole systems. What's the forefront of modern theory? I return to probability expert Ivan Corwin. There are kind of two themes that are really coming up a lot in, in probability research these days. So the first is universality, and the second is integrability. So universality refers to the question uh, or the phenomena that uh, despite different microscopic natures of systems, a lot of different systems look the same when you zoom out or when you look at them out over a long period of time in the, in the right scale. Uh, and integrability deals with the question of what do they look like? You know, yeah, an, example an example of how of this works. Right, so, so universality. So you could imagine um, an example of, say, particles on, moving on the line, so your traffic. So you have cars in, lined up in a row, and they try to move to the right, and they do so after some random amount of time. And so you can ask how many cars will have crossed a given location over a long period of time. You can compute, you know, the, the average number of cars. That's like a law of large numbers. And then you can ask about the fluctuations around that. And under this particular model, you can show that the fluctuation will grow in scale, like the one third power of time. Universality holds that it's actually not just kind of within one class, but between classes, you have a lot, oftentimes the exact same distributions, the exact same statistics arising. So let's take the example of, of uh, bacterial growth on a Petri dish. So you, you inculcate a, a little bacterial colony in the middle of a Petri dish and you watch it grow outward. And you look at the boundary and you see that the boundary is roughly growing spherically or cir circularly but the, the, there are fluctuations. And you can ask, how do the fluctuations grow as a function of time? And you do this on a 1,000 Petri dishes, and you, and you measure over time. And you see that the fluctuations, it's supposed to be also the one third power of time, or in a sense, the radius, and the exact same distribution that I mentioned in the context of traffic flow. So there's something very universal about this distribution coming up. OK, let's go on to integrability. Okay, so the, the first inter example of integrability is coin flipping. You flip a coin a thousand times, you ask how many heads or tails there are. Now you can enumerate the outcomes, and that's very complicated, or you can use what's called the binomial formula, which tells you that you can write it in terms of factorials. Now once you have a formula, you can start, start to take asymptotics of, of factorials. So you go from a microscopic formula, you perform asymptotics, you show that kind of the formula is, admits large scale limits, and that gives you this, this uh, statistic, in this case, the bell curve. There turn out to be a certain number of special systems, systems that have some enhanced mathematical structure that allow you to actually compute formulas, albeit a little bit more complicated than factorials, but formulas that don't grow in complexity as the system size grows. It's this notion of integrability that informs what is universal and universality gives steam to integrability, it gives it power. A lot of the world is large and a lot of the world is too complicated to really deterministically understand, so it's effectively random. And the ubiquity of, of probability is kind of a, a necessary thing. Probability gives you this sort of dimensional reduction from you know, this very complicated deterministic world to, to a much more uh, hand, you know, uh, tangible ran but, but random world. So there's a little bit of a cost in that, but, but you still gain a lot in, in terms of tractability. To probe the deep meaning of probability, I begin with the profound power of probability, refining data, assessing theories, touching ultimate reality. There are two basic kinds of probability, inherent randomness of quantum systems, a way of describing non-random systems. Probability in cosmology quantifies confidence in measurements, adjudicates competing models, reveals how quantum fluctuations become galactic structures. 
But perhaps at the foundations of physics, we do not understand probability. Contrarians should be appreciated for keeping us open-minded and humble. Probability is a way of capturing things we do not understand, or is variable, or is random. The deep meaning of probability reflects its duality. The two pillars of probability split personality and science. One, a basic operating principle of deepest quantum physics. Two, an analytical tool that parses past events and predicts future events to discern how things work at deepest levels. To understand the elements that compose our world and perhaps its ultimate essence, probability is key. So, what's the probability we are closer to truth? For complete interviews and for further information, please visit closertotruth.com.